well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with us on the program today. We're going to be talking with the Rob Dorr of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus about an omnibus public safety bill with some ominous gun control measures attached to it. Yeah, you've got a red flag law that has basically no due process protections whatsoever. You have a uh, quote-unquote universal background check bill that all is also gun registration, uh, as well as perhaps a 30-day waiting period for private transfers of firearms. Yeah, we'll get to uh, all of that and more with the Rob. Uh, before we do, however, you know, when you make choices about where to put your hard-earned dollars, you're supporting not only the company that makes the product, but the values and the principles of that organization as well. And it's easier to flip a switch against a company when they blatantly conflict with your values, right? We've seen this with Bud Light recently um, and consumers just choosing to go elsewhere because uh, Bud Light is, well, uh, doing a lot of things to uh, tick them off, including, you know, saying that we don't really like who our audience is. That's bad. But do you make an effort to do business with the companies that support what you believe when you can. Do yourself a favor. Give Defender Ammunition Company a shot. These guys are veteran-owned and operated. Every person on their staff is military-connected. They're huge supporters of the military community, backing causes that are actually making a difference in the lives of those that served. In fact, the profits from all of their logoed gear goes directly to the charities that they back. These companies want to support. Their ammo's top-notch. Their customer service is great. What other shipping department actually writes handwritten thank-you notes to their customers? Give these guys a try. They have thrown us a promo code that you can use through the end of May. That code is Bearing Arms, real easy to remember, B E A R I N G A R M S, good for 5% off your order. Trust me, once you give these guys a try, you won't be going anywhere else. Check them out at DefenderAmmunition.com. So let's talk with uh, Rob Dorr of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus about the uh, devil in the details of these supposedly common sense gun measures, uh, as well as the arm twisting that is going on right now. Uh, in the DFL caucus in Minnesota. Democrats have a one-vote majority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and while it looks like the fix might be in here, uh, we're going to get an update from Rob. Take a look and a listen. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I, I really appreciate it. I know it's a, a very busy time for you guys at the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus, especially with this um, last-minute compromise that was uh, unveiled and quickly approved yesterday. Uh, I got to ask, first of all, what the hell was the compromise? Because I've looked at the language of these bills and they're awful. These gun control bills are awful. Well, and, and there is no compromise. The language is literally exactly the same that the Senate passed off of the Judiciary Committee uh, you know, a month ago. Uh, there has been no changes from you know all of the egregious things that we pointed out at the last time. But here's what's a little bit more insidious is they've only dropped the bills 14 minutes before they started discussing them. There was no language to be seen except for 14 minutes before. And then the all Democrat conference committee, which contains five members of the House and five members of the Senate, uh, passed it into the omnibus bill with zero debate and zero testimony. So um, that wouldn't happen unless there had been some behind the scenes discussions ahead of time. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan. Um, you know, we had heard that there were a couple of uh, holdouts, and uh, I think one of the members of this conference committee actually was she, she had uh, said that she had concerns about uh, red flag laws, a lack of due process, but yet she rubber stamped this thing when it uh, when it came before. Well, and even more than that, there uh, we've got a newspaper here called Min Post, and one of their reporters, a guy named Walker Ornstein, has been chasing this issue down hard, trying to get these you know three Greater Minnesota and this one suburban. Uh, a Democrat to commit to their proposals. She told him earlier on in the day that she has been working at the bills were in a very different shape than they were the last time we saw them because she's been working to address the issues of gun owners, concerns of gun owners. And when the language comes out, it is literally verbatim what passed out of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, which I'll add was never passed off of the Senate floor. Really? Okay. So again, a, a backdoor way to enact a red flag law, a backdoor way to enact not only a, a universal background checks, but gun registration. And, and Rob, help me if I'm reading this right. 
is it sounds to me like under the provisions of this background check bill, private transfers of firearms, it's not like you just go to your local gun store and you say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, selling a gun to my neighbor. I, I got to go through a background check. You got to go to your local police department first, right? So, you know, so there's two mechanisms that they provide because, you know, one is the the FFL, uh, but recognizing that there are some parts of Minnesota where you're literally three hours away from the closest gun store. Uh, they, the, our benevolent leaders in the Democrat Party here have decided to offer another path, which is you can get a uh, a permit to purchase. So if you want to get a handgun, uh, you know, uh, it's if you want to in Minnesota, if you want to get a handgun or a scary looking black rifle, you have to get a permit that is a, a, just a background check on top of the per, the you know, the background check that you do uh, when you buy the gun at the gun store. Now you can use that permit. But here's the thing. It is not just sales. It is transfer. So, Cam, if you come up to Minnesota, you didn't fly with any guns, but you wanted to go deer hunting. You wanted to use my 300 blackout to go deer hunting. I couldn't just hand you that gun to go deer hunting. First, you would have to go to a uh, police uh, department here, get a permit to purchase uh, that takes up to under this bill. It'll take up to 30 days to get. Uh, then I can transfer that to you. We have to keep both you and I have to keep a record of that transfer for 10 years and supply it upon demand, not with warrant or subpoena. Uh, to any law enforcement officer. But now you get to go hunting with that firearm. We've satisfied all of these these requirements. But guess what happens if when you need to hand my gun back to me? Can you just hand it back to me? No, I have to go get a permit to purchase. And then I I have to record, you you have to record all of that information about this transfer. And then uh, I we both have to keep that for 10 years and surrender it upon demand to any uh, government official. You know, and again, this is going to hurt rural gun owners the most, right? Those folks who, as you say, might live three hours away from a gun store. Um, all of a sudden now they're subject to perhaps a 30 day waiting period, right? For, for loaning a firearm uh, to a friend or a neighbor. I mean, this is absolutely absurd. The idea that criminals, by the way, are going to follow <laughs> either going to an FFL or getting a permit to purchase is absolutely asinine. Um, but let's talk about the red flag bill too, because this is uh, again, that lawmaker said, well, you know, I'm concerned about the lack of due process protections. OK, well, there are no due process protections, right? No. Part hearings. Your property is seized before you have your, uh, your day in court. And That's not due process, period. No, absolutely. And and help me uh, again. I, I, I looked at the bill, but I'm always willing to acknowledge I might have missed it. You've probably looked at this a lot closer than I have. There is no provision in there. If you can't afford an attorney. One's not provided to you, right? There, yeah. there's, there's no it's public defender. This is a civil case, right? And so you're on your own facing a district attorney or a prosecutor, uh, which again I think cuts against the due process uh, of, the, right. of the accused here. And it's going to be there's going to be a tremendous disenfranchisement of marginalized communities as well. You know, that's one thing is this same bill that they packaged this all up in. Um, uh, you know, bans no knock warrants because that they were, you know, they, they were being used disproportionately against marginalized communities and overused. Yet, uh, there's nothing in this bill that prevents a no knock warrant from being used to go in and seize firearms under a red flag law. So they're not even remaining consistent with their own agenda. It just goes to show it is about making gun ownership as difficult, as onerous, as socially awkward and socially unacceptable as possible in the efforts that people will just stop doing it. So, so what is your advice to Minnesota gun owners right now? Because again, we saw one of these uh, supposed fence straddlers, uh, you know, endorse the bill uh, and, and pass it out to committee. And then I'm looking at a story here from uh, Northern News Now. You guys tweeted this out on your uh, on your Twitter feed. Uh, Senator Grant Housechild is one of those Democrats who had been quiet uh, about the, uh, the the gun control legislation until the conference committee then passed this omnibus bill out. Now, all of a sudden, he's fully on board, right? Yeah. And, and you know, to be honest, I've met with all of these uh, these senators. Uh, Grant Housechild uh, was the one who I never had any doubts that he was going to support this. Um, he barely won his election up in the up in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, which is a tremendously pro-gun. Even his Democrat uh, predecessor, the senator who held that seat before he did, said you cannot vote for guns and retain your seat or vote against gun rights and retain your seat in this district. We're one of the most pro-gun districts in the state, even though they vote Democrat. There's a lot of union workers, a lot of, you know, uh, iron workers, things like that up there. Um, so a, a lot of it's more heretically uh, Democrat than, than policy wise Democrat. 
but um, he knows this. So, I mean, that's a clear indication to me that, um, you know, he just moved into the state to run for this seat. He failed to run in North Dakota. Uh, then he moved into a bluer city uh, and managed to win that seat. Uh, I think he just wanted state senator on his resume and he never had any intention of supporting this. But we do have several other legislators who we can lean on to try to uh, try to uh, defeat this bill. OK, so you don't think this is a fait accompli. This is not a time for gun owners to give up. No, I, we, we still have. Uh, so here's why they did things the way that they did by packing it, packaging it together like this, avoiding a straight up or down vote on the Senate floor. They put this in a bill that also funds our courts. It funds our Department of Public Safety. It funds uh, the prisons, uh, you know, all of the prisons. It does all of those things so that now it gives a lot of political cover to these guys. But yeah, I didn't like the gun bills, but geez, we got to fund our public defenders and our courts and our prisons. We can't just have prisoners, you know, uh, prisons that are unfunded. It gives them that political cover. Uh, but uh, and when it goes onto the floor, there is no chance for amendments. It is a straight up or down vote. Adopt the committee report or reject the committee report. So we need to put as much pressure on these senators as possible uh, to reject these committee reports. Are, are there any senators that you're targeting in particular right now? Yeah. So we're, we're still keeping up the pressure on uh, on uh, Senator Housechild. Uh, we're not letting him off the hook. Uh, we're keeping up the pressure on Senator Seberger. She won her district by 330 some odd votes. I guarantee you I can find 330 gun, uh, gun owners who didn't vote in the last election uh, to vote against her next election. Uh, we need to make her mindful of that. There's also Senator Kupak, who, who has said uh, he doesn't much see, see much problem with background checks, but he has a big heartburn about the red flag laws. Uh, so uh, those are in this bill. We need to have him you know, stand up for his constituents. Uh, and stand up against this metrocentric Democrat party that is pushing these gun control agendas and actually represent their districts, which are overwhelmingly pro Second Amendment. Absolutely. Hey, listen, Rob, uh, do we have any idea when this vote is going to happen? So I imagine that they're going to wrap up the uh, conference bill today in committee in the uh, uh, Public Safety Committee. Uh, so then that could it literally could be on the on the floor as early as today, tomorrow uh, or anytime next week. Uh, we are constitutionally required uh, to end by Monday, the 22nd. Uh, so it can't be any later than that. But I imagine they're going to want to get this one. Uh, probably a Friday news dump would be my guess. Uh, uh, so uh, it's uh, they'll probably pass it late in the day on Friday, hoping that nobody notices. All right. Well, listen, I I, um, I hope that we don't have to have a follow up conversation about uh, litigation challenging these uh, provisions. But uh, if we do, uh, we'll certainly have you back. But in the meantime, uh, again, thank you for everything that you're doing. I appreciate the insight and Minnesota gun owners. I mean, you heard from Rob, uh, your lawmakers need to be hearing from you right now uh, about these terrible infringements on our right to keep and bear arms. Uh, Rob Dorr, the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Thank you, as always, man. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Cam. Appreciate it. I do appreciate Rob joining us on the uh, program, which was better news. But uh, again, the fight is still on right now in the legislature, but uh, maybe onto the courts here before long. Hopefully, again, we can uh, pull this one out without having to challenge these uh, awful, awful infringements in court. Uh, right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day as well as our recidivist report. Actually, before we get to that, there is something we need to talk about. What is happening with the banks? It's literally crazy. Can you imagine what this is going to do to the retirement savings of America? Now, I want to tell you what I've heard from Augusta Precious Metals. Gold buying is on fire right now because people want gold IRAs to protect the retirement savings. And get this, if you have 100000 plus saved for retirement, Augusta will pay you in pure gold to learn how gold IRAs can protect you. That is a big deal. A pure gold coin for free. Reach out to Augusta Precious Metals today and learn how you can get started with gold. Don't let bank failures get you down. Get this free gold and get some peace of mind. Just call 855-222-4997 to learn whether gold can help protect your retirement and get your free gold coin. That's Augusta Precious Metals at 855-222-4997. Again, 855-222-4997. All right, let's turn our attention to today's Armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We'll start there with an infuriating story out of Florida where a 13-year-old on probation for stealing a gun ends up in a shootout with a Central Florida police officer in Lakeland on Wednesday. Yeah, uh, absolutely unbelievable. According to authorities, this 13-year-old who's been on probation since January after he was caught stealing a gun 
um, was in a car that police suspected was part of a drive-by shooting. Uh, an officer nearby saw the suspect vehicle begin a pursuit. Then three individuals bailed out of that car. Uh, the 13-year-old was spotted with a gun. Another officer who was involved tried to get the team to drop the firearm, but instead that team began shooting at the officer. Officer was struck in the foot, but continued chasing the 13-year-old to later engaged in a shootout that saw the teen shot several times. Both officer and suspect taken to a local hospital in Tampa with non-life-threatening injuries. The Lakeland police chief, Sam Taylor, said he's 13 years old. Unbelievable. What are we doing? A 13-year-old that has an arrest history and also has the fortitude and anger inside of him to point a handgun at a police officer. But not only point that handgun, but take a shot at a police officer. Polk County Sheriff Grady Judge said the uh, teen arrested on January the 1st after a deputy found him in possession of a stolen firearm. Judge said, uh, did he appreciate the probation? No. I mean, actually, I, I think he probably did appreciate the probation. He just... Um, didn't appreciate the seriousness of the crime that he had been charged with. And why would he? Again, the criminal justice system didn't seem to take this all that seriously either. Given him probation, don't know what kind of supervised probation that was. Maybe it was unsupervised, how intensive it was. Was he required to attend any sort of counseling? Was he required to uh, get drug or alcohol treatment? Was he drug tested? I mean, we don't know. But what we do know is that this wasn't enough. And I don't think this 13-year-old should have been thrown in prison for the rest of his life for stealing a gun or being in possession of a stolen firearm. But that is a warning sign. And it deserves consequences. Even if the goal is rehabilitation, not incarceration, there needs to be consequences as part of rehabilitation. As part of teaching this 13-year-old, hey, you're going down the wrong path. And you're going to end up in a very bad place if you keep going in this direction. Now, because this 13-year-old has shot a police officer, that bad path, he's already down it. I, I suspect that the next time around, he's not going to get a sweetheart plea deal. Because he's a juvenile, he'll probably be released when he's 18 or 21. But, um, yeah, this makes me angry at the lack of consequences, once again, that we're seeing in the juvenile justice system and the recidivism that we're seeing as well. And this isn't just a Florida problem. This is happening all across the country. Now, today's Armed Citizen story from Las Vegas, Nevada, where police say a man who is fleeing authorities was fatally shot by the driver of a vehicle, uh, apparently after he tried to carjack uh, this uh, car in an attempt to get away. Now, this started out as basically a call about a guy tagging a wall. In Las Vegas, around 1.20 yesterday afternoon, police responded near uh, University Center Drive in East Hacienda Avenue about a guy spray painting a wall. The police tried to stop him. He ends up taking off and police noticed that he had a gun on him. According to the Metropolitan Police Department, Lieutenant Jason Johansson, police held back after seeing the gun. I'm not sure why that would be the case. To me, that would be an indication that, OK, we got to get this guy now. Uh, but the man was able to run onto Paradise Road started pointing his gun at passing vehicles. One silver car ended up stopping. There were two people inside, driver and a passenger. The driver, a man in his 50s, according to police, uh, was armed with a firearm and shot the uh, other man who was uh, transported to a local hospital where he was pronounced dead. Lieutenant Johansson with the Metropolitan Police says the man who fatally shot the other man not facing charges, cooperating with the police, says it does appear that they were the victims of a possible carjacking, or at least somebody pointing a gun at him before that occurred. So, again, we don't know what this situation would have been like had that driver not been armed. Uh, but police could have gone out for a call about a, uh, uh, you know, a minor incident of vandalism and ended up with a carjacking, attempted murder, maybe even a homicide or a double homicide. Thankfully, that wasn't the case because this guy was able to protect himself. You know, I'd still love some answers as to why the uh, Metropolitan Police Department decided to hang back. Once they saw that this suspect was armed, but uh, maybe we'll get some answers in the days to come. Finally, today, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a homeless man in California who you may have seen this video went viral a couple of days ago. He saved a baby in a, a car stroller that was getting ready to roll into traffic. This is I know this is one of those trite phrases. Every parent's worst nightmare. This really is every parent's worst nightmare. Um, I don't know if, if you are a parent, you may have had one of these dreams when your kid was little and they're in trouble. And it's like you're moving through quicksand or molasses and you can't get there in time. 
That was literally what happened to the mom of this child. She was getting her baby out, put the baby in the stroller. She's going to close the car door. She slips and she falls on the ground. And the stroller starts moving away from her towards this busy, busy road. She scrambles to get up. She falls down again. I mean, again, I can't imagine the panic that was going through her. But thankfully, there was uh, somebody who was able to step in. Ron Nesman was uh, at a nearby gas station, a nearby car wash. Um, with his sister when he heard the screams for help. He ended up racing to the stroller and was able to stop it before it went into the oncoming traffic. Um, As it turns out, Ron Nesman had just come from a job interview. Ron Nesman has been homeless for the past eight years in California's high desert. And uh, after that video went viral, the general manager of the Applebee's in Victorville, California, where he interviewed, said the video had nothing to do with her hiring decision, but I don't think it hurt. Uh, Nesman apparently nailed the interview because he got the job at, uh, at Applebee's. So he is fully employed now, uh, and he is looking to turn his life around. He said, you know, I knew I could get the stroller, and I'm thankful for that because I really wouldn't want to see the end result if I wasn't there. He said, if you want something different in your life, you need to do something different. And that's where I'm at today. So, Ron Nesman, I hope that this is the start of a new chapter in your life. And I'm glad to see that uh, you want something different. You're doing something different. I hope that it pays off for you, sir. Again, in the right place, at the right time, willing able to do the right thing. Ron Nesman, we thank you for your very, very good deed. And we wish you the best of luck in the future. Now, that's going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program, as always. Looking forward to being back with you on Monday. Uh, And when we talk again, uh, yes, we'll have much more of the latest Second Amendment news and information to discuss. But in addition to that, uh, you know, you can always check out BearingArms.com throughout the weekend. And we'll make sure that you're up to date on all of the news that's important to your right to keep and bear arms. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.